remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook here with, I suppose, my official State of the Union response. I, I kind of figured that this year, since everybody else is doing an official State of the Union response, I might as well do one too. So I wanted to quickly get this thing out here audio only uh, for the, the sake of time here. And just to give you a lay of the land of what I'm doing here, I am taping this response immediately following the end of Obama's speech. Uh, I have not heard any of the pundits or the talking heads analyze this thing yet. I have not heard uh, Marco Rubio's response or Rand Paul's response. I hope to hear both of those later tonight. Instead, I wanted to give you my absolute gut reaction to what I've just heard without any sort of uh, of influence from anybody else. I wanted to give this to you just, just as I interpreted it, just as I saw it. And then, uh, of course, I'll t partake of the analysis and so forth later. I know there are some saying that uh, Rubio's response and Paul's response are likely to, to, to be in conflict within the GOP. I doubt that'll be the case. I think that it just shows that we have a lot of different opinions in the GOP right now on the American right, and that truly we are the, uh, the big tent in American politics right now, not the other side. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I, I promised myself, because I was aware that most of this speech would deal with the economy, that I was going to focus on the economic end of things in my response. Uh, Sure, I, there's, there's a number of things I could go off on Obama about across the board on this thing, but if we did that on every single thing that raised my blood pressure tonight, well, this response would go on for five or six hours, and neither one of us want that. So I'm going to hold fast to the economic end of this speech here tonight. Uh, as tempting as it is to go into the whole gun control thing he did at the end and return his speech into a Sally Struthers commercial was absolutely disgusting. Uh, and I almost made me want to throw a few things in the TV, but... Uh, that part I found particularly disgusting. And Okay, I, I will say this about the gun control side, and then I'll, I'll get off of it. I will say this much. With all of your talk about so-called sensible legislation and limits and so on and so forth, I would like to know uh, just how you think all of those people down there in Southern California who for the last several days have had to live in fear of one of your supporters, Christopher Dorner, uh, who's been on a serial killing rampage, just how would... Just how would so-called sensible gun limits have made those people more safe while that idiot was running around, uh, running around on the loose for the last few days? Thankfully, it sounds like he's been taken out now, but one of your supporters was out there terrorizing Southern California, and I, I would be interested to know how so-called sensible uh, gun limits and, and banning so-called assault rifles would have made those law-abiding citizens any more secure with your supporter, Christopher Dorner, running around shooting people at will. Okay. I will leave the gun control part of this alone. I promised myself I would. Let's go back to the economic side of this. On the economic end, what was presented to us tonight by Mr. Obama was a very grandiose, very large-encompassing notion of government involvement to spur the economy. We heard Obama make mention of a lot of different things tonight, such as more investment in, in green jobs, which makes me think if green jobs are such a good investment, why wouldn't the private sector be doing it? And, and before you just dismiss that, think it through. If green jobs are such a good investment, then the, the potential rate of return on investment would be high. If the rate of return on investment is high, potentially, yeah, the private sector would do it. If the private sector is not doing it, what does that tell you? It tells you that most likely it is a bad investment, that the demand is not there for it. And yet he wants to take my tax dollars and invest in that. He wants to take my tax dollars and your tax dollars and make a bad fiscal investment, something that has a low likelihood of a rate of return. Now, how does that make sense? Well, when you and I think about it, it really doesn't. But yet that's what he's advocating. Oh, he wants green jobs. He wants to raise the minimum wage, raise the federal minimum wage. Which I know sounds good if you don't think it through. But take it to that next step. How does raising the minimum wage better enable us to compete with 
companies overseas that are hiring and, and competing for our jobs, which is easier to do now than it's ever been because of technology. Because you can now have, let's say, a, a call center in India or wherever, and you don't have to build it here. And if we raise our minimum wage, do you think the rest of the world is going to keep up? Heavens no, they're going to take advantage of it. Oh, but he thinks raising the minimum wage is the pathway to prosperity, which is to say raising the cost of doing business in America is the pathway to prosperity. Oh, but he didn't stop there. He, he's claiming that absolutely none of this will increase the deficit. I will believe it when I see it. But one of the justifications he had for that was continued talk, as we've heard for four years plus, of continuing to soak the wealthiest Americans, or as he referred to them at one point, the most well-connected Americans, as though accomplishment has nothing to do with their wealth. He called them well-connected, not most accomplished. But he wants to soak those Americans with yet even more tax increases. And there again I ask you, when you are taxing the wealthy, who are already being taxed at an unfairly high rate to begin with, and now you want to tax them more, and now you want to charge higher minimum wage. How on earth could you logically expect them to invest money in this nation? How on earth could you expect them to invest in factories and businesses and job creation here on anything but the most obvious and sure bets, the, the most sure propositions would be all they would invest in. They would not take chances. They would not take risks. And our nation, our economy, all economies actually are built on the concept of taking risk. You take that out of the equation, you cannot grow an economy. And then Obama turned to the ideas of rebuilding our infrastructure, rebuilding our bridges, rebuilding all of those things, and using that as a mechanism for increasing employment, using that as a mechanism for reducing unemployment. And it struck me as I heard that particular portion of the speech that I think I've heard this somewhere before. Now granted, a lot of people that I was following on social media during the speech, they, they mentioned something similar. They said, hey, this State of the Union address sounds like the last four State of the Union addresses. I, I suppose it did. Some of them said that it sounded like many of his campaign speeches. Well, again, I suppose it did. But I'm going back much further than this. The things I'm hearing from Barack Obama tonight, particularly when it comes to the economy, seems to me to have an awful lot in common with some of the things that Franklin Delano Roosevelt said back in the 1930s. This seems awfully similar to the New Deal. Now some of you who are criticizing me are out there right now saying, well we need a New Deal. We need a new New Deal, if you will. That worked so well the first time. It ended the Great Depression, did it really? See, folks, we've been down this road before. Barack Obama is not just regurgitating his talking points from the last four years, as much as he is regurgitating the talking points and the logic of liberal ideologues for generations, be they Lyndon Johnson, be they John F. Kennedy, be they Franklin Roosevelt, be they Woodrow Wilson. Barack Obama is simply the latest in the long line. Did the New Deal erase the Great Depression? No, it did not. It exacerbated it. We paid farmers to destroy crops and livestock while people went hungry. There's government planning for you. But did that help the agricultural prices in the end? No, it did not. By the close of the 1930s, agricultural prices were only four-fifths of, the, of what their levels were in 1929. So all that government interference to go down a step. In spite of all of that tinkering by the government. Roosevelt's presidency borrowed more money than the government had in all of history up to that point. While Obama continues to increase our deficit, FDR's New Deal took us from the surpluses of Harding and Coolidge to, for the first significant time in history, a situation where debt started to go into the political lexicon and be talked about as we are talking about it today. It seems that Obama learned his lessons well. As for unemployment, high unemployment usually hovering around a fifth of the workforce, stayed fairly consistent through the first two terms of FDR's presidency, about nine years, right up until Pearl Harbor and World War II. So that unemployment was not solved by the New Deal. World War II solved it. The Dow Jones average did not hit its 1929 level again until the 1950s. 
Gross domestic product did not get back to its 1929 levels until FDR's third term, third term, right there in the middle of World War II. Now, I'm at the risk of boring you with a bunch of statistics, just to make a point. We have gone down this road of attempting to assuage unemployment by government interference before, and it failed miserably every time we've tried it. We've tried to eradicate poverty in the past, the way that Obama hinted at tonight. Lyndon Johnson tried to eradicate poverty. It was called the Great Society. Our cities are still war zones as a result. While Barack Obama is trying to tell you he's advocating something new, he is doing anything but. He is advocating the same tired old ideas that have failed many times in the past, in, in a time that has slightly different challenges and, and different specifics. He is advocating the same tired ideas and just repackaging them. And yes... Just like practically every liberal before him, Barack Obama tonight tried to make the case that education and our spending on education is a key to our economic prosperity. That if we just spent more money on education and in a more intelligent way, that would be our road to fiscal nirvana. Sounds good, doesn't it? But let's think that one through. We are, at this point in time, putting our children, our younger generations, through more hours of schooling than any generation prior to them. We are spending more on education, money-wise, now than we ever have. In the year 2008 and 2009, we spent $610 billion plus on education. And if you adjust those numbers for inflation, spending on education per capita has risen over 200% since the 1970s and over 500% since the 1960s. And during that time period, of course, you had the feds taking over education. So we are spending more money on education than we ever have. We are giving our children more hours in a classroom than they have ever had in previous generations. We have, I would suspect, far more, uh, far more students and young people graduating high school or being exposed to some high school, at the very least, than we had in, few, in previous generations more kids attending college and some even graduating than we've had in previous generations and yet we are still in this financial pickle and yet we have had far stronger economies during times when we spent far less on education when far fewer people had far fewer hours in the classroom than they have today so that idea that logic makes no sense either now don't get me wrong i have no problem with looking at ways to spend our education money more intelligently. Obama tonight talked about redesigning our high schools to produce graduates that are more ready for the workforce. Well, I like that idea, but it strikes me that the government is probably the worst possible entity to try to do that. I would think the private sector could do that so much more better. Or getting the business community involved. They would do it so much better. After all, who better to tell you what employers need out of graduates than employers themselves. How can the government do that? They're disconnected from the process. I would maintain to you that I would think, given the quality of education we've had in our past, way in our past, when we did not have federal control over it, when we spent far less money on it, I believe we can manage our schools far more intelligently and we can educate our students far more efficiently and for far cheaper than we do today and produce far more ready students for the workforce. I believe we can do that and I believe we don't need a government to do it, at least at the federal level. But that's not what Obama thinks. Obama's answers throughout this entire speech were nothing more than tax the rich and have the government spend money on something, anything, and hope that it gives someone a job. Ignoring the past failures of such logic, some of which we are still enduring today, you want to know why we're in debt up to our eyeballs? It's because of the entitlement spending of the FDR years. It's because of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Not because of the wars, as some would tell you. Entitlement spending is over 60% of our budget. Military spending is under 20%. That's the 800-pound gorilla in the room. But yet, Obama said at one point tonight that cutting Medicare to save the military is, is not a good idea. 
Sounds to me like he's got his numbers reversed, if he understands them at all. What's the old phrase? The second verse, same as the worst, a little bit louder and a whole lot worse. That's exactly what this is. And for a guy who claims that he wants Congress to come together and get behind some of these ideas, these are mostly asinine ideas that no Congress should get behind, that no Republican should get behind. Were there some minor things in what he said tonight that could appease some Republicans? Sure there were. But that, that small olive branch to entice you to then get beaten by the billy club, that's not worth it. That is not worth it at all. If this speech was designed to bring about unity and cooperation in Washington, which I do not believe that it was, although it was positioned that way, if that's what this speech was about, then it failed miserably. For those of us who want America to get stronger fiscally again, who want this economy to come back, and realize that that cannot be done through government, Mr. Obama, your speech offered zero. It offered nothing. And so I say to you tonight that America is in the same place that it was before this speech, and America has been in the same place it has been throughout Obama's presidency circling the proverbial commode of history and fighting for dear life not to go down the pipe. That's my response. I'm sure that we'll talk about more of this in more detail, particularly the gun control crap, I'm sure, in some of my future episodes. But that's it for this time. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. And it's clear after tonight, our work as conservatives and as Americans is only just beginning. This is America's Evil Genius, Travis Cook. We shall see you next time.